This is the second Sunday after Epiphany. The epistle is taken from <clears throat> St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 12. <clears throat> Brethren, we have gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us, such as prophecy, to be used according to the proportion of faith or ministry in ministering, or he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhorting, he who gives in simplicity, he who presides with carefulness, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without pretense. Hate what is evil. Hold to what is good. Love one another with fraternal charity, anticipating one another with honor. Be not slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Be patient in tribulation, persevering in prayer. Share the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of one mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but condescend to the lowly. The Holy Gospel. From St. John, chapter 2. At that time, a marriage took place in Cana, Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now Jesus, too, was invited to the marriage, and also his disciples. And the wine, having run short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, What wouldst thou have me to do, woman? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the attendants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water jars were placed there, after the Jewish manner of purification, each holding two or three measures apiece. So that would be about 253 gallons of water. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And Jesus said to them, draw out now and take to the chief steward. And they took it to him. Now, when the chief steward had tasted the water after it had become wine, not knowing whence it was, Though the attendants who had drawn the water knew, the chief steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at first, first sets forth the good wine, and when they have drunk freely, then that which is poorer. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This first of his miracles Jesus did at Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So as you see, this Mass is being live-streamed <clears throat> because many of our Catholic fellow warriors in the Church Militant, some families haven't had Mass in over two years now, in Canada, for example with all the terrible uh, tyranny going on and moving all over the globe, and Australia as well. So many do uh, ask that the Mass be recorded so they can be at home and follow the Mass with their missiles and make a spiritual communion. So they send their guardian angels to Mass with us, and we're coming to those days where the Mass is, getting, is going to get harder to find and we have a Pope right now waging a war against the very heart of the Catholic Church, the very sacrifice of the Mass. So we say with Tertullian of the early Church what he said to the Roman emperors, go ahead, cut us down, mow us over. The more you kill us, the more we grow. For the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. <clears throat> so we say to Pope Francis, <clears throat> and all these political psychopaths, go ahead, try to crush out our Catholic faith. Go ahead, mow us down, imprison us, cut us up, behead us. 
put us through a chipper. The more you cut us down, the more we grow. And the Blessed Virgin Mary foretold great persecutions that will rise again. She foretold starvation, famines, which is one of the effects of communism. She foretold great persecutions on the church. And we're going through one already. We're going through one right now where many are losing their job and many just can't even get to Mass because of these uh, crazy mandates. So also I ask your prayers for a family of, of, uh, of uh, ranchers up in Montana. John and Ruth, they were elderly and they just died within a few weeks apart. Pray for their souls. John Delamada and Ruth, great people, great, uh, great Montana folks. And then his son, Michael, he was 71. He died also. And uh, I have to say, a lot of, some of these deaths that I'm hearing all over the country are immediate results of you-know-what into the arm. So <clears throat> don't take it. It'll mean your death, and plus it's a compromise. You're not allowed to take anything from aborted babies, killed, massacred babies while they're alive. You're not allowed to use that as medicine. It's, it's even a pagan can understand that. And here we got priests and bishops all confused. It's very clear. You don't murder babies and use them as medicine, period. You don't need a complicated theology book to see through this. And this is why the, the stand, official stand of the, of the new conciliar SSPX is very serious to give approval to these crimes. And the more people use it, the more the industry goes on. It feeds the industry of this slaughter of children. So thank God there's a few prelates and a few priests that are condemning it. And of course, YouTube is quick to take on, down anything that goes against the narrative so we have to stand strong against this. And we, and we have to, fathers of families, you have to, all right, I might lose my job over this. Big deal. You have a father in heaven who provides for you. He'll get you something else. But we cannot compromise on these moral questions. And that's what the new SSPS is, the new S. The new SSPX is saying, the conciliar SSPX is saying, is if you're going to lose your job, you can take it. And that's like telling the early martyrs, yeah, if you're going to be forced and you're going to be put to death because you have to burn a few grains of incense, then put a few grains of incense. They don't mean it, though. But that's not how it works before God. Remember Eleazar in the book of Maccabees, they told him, look, you're an old man, we respect your old age. We know you're a Jew and you don't eat meat. Remember, the Jewish religion was a true religion before Christ came. So they told him, look, we won't serve you pork. We'll give you whatever you want, but we won't serve you pork and you can eat that. But others will think you're eating it, but you won't really be eating, this, eating it, so you won't displease your God. So see, everything will be just fine. And Eleazar, the old wise man, said no. He said, if I eat if I eat what I want and not eat pork, yet the, the youngsters out there think that I'm eating pork. I scandalize them. So he said, I'd kill me. I'd rather die than compromise. So Eleazar was put to death. And then, of course, we have the great examples of St. Isaac Jogues. St. Isaac Jogues, who probably trekked through Syracuse with the Indians on their hunts. They dragged him around as their slave for a while. And he would be freezing to death. <clears throat> and there were occasions when they would celebrate the catch of several bucks. And they would cut, gut, the, gut open the, the bucks and start cooking the meat. And they offered the meat to one of the devils. I forgot the name of it, but one of the Mohawk devils. They worshipped the god of the hunters. So when they started eating it, it, sound, it sure smelled good, barbecued venison. And when you're hungry and cold, you know how good that is, especially we have a family here of hunters. You all <laughs> appreciate well-cooked venison. 
So uh, St. Isaac Jogues, starving to death, freezing to death nearly, they offered him the meat. So did he, did he say what Father Pagliariani recently said in a talk, that the, the district's, the superior general of the SSPX, the superior general said, well, St. Paul says you can eat it. No, that's not what St. Paul says. It's a misunderstanding of St. Paul. He says, don't eat meat if it's going to scandalize other Jews that are newly converted. Don't eat it. That's what he meant. Just don't cause scandal. So what St. Isaac Jogues did was he said, no, I cannot eat this meat. It's offered to the devil. And he was a Jesuit on top of that. And the Jesuits are known for their great distinctions in morality. But he had this, the Catholic faith. He said, I would not eat. I would not eat that meat. And he went hungry that night and many nights hungry. And all he had was some mush corn for supper. So we have to uh, not weaken and slacken <clears throat> nor, nor compromise the Catholic faith. We're not allowed to do this. So let's look at today's saint. And I bring him up because of our great founders, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, was named after St. Marcellus. Here he is. St. Marcellus was a Roman and was a pope from the reign of Constantius and Galerius to that of Maxentius, so under three Roman emperors. It was by his counsel that the Roman matron, Lucina, made the Church of God the heir of her property. On account of the increase in the number of the faithful, he established for their use new titular churches in the city of Rome, and he arranged them as 25 new districts for the administration of baptism and penance to converts to the Christian religion and for the burial of the martyrs. So here is a pope right in the middle of the, of the heated persecutions under the several emperors, and the church is growing. And they're having baptisms, they're having confessions. He establishes 25 other churches in Rome. All this greatly angered Maxentius, and he threatened St. Marcellus with severe tortures unless he laid down his pontifical office and offered sacrifice to the idols. So there it is burn a little incense to the gods of Rome. And today, burn a little incense of compromise with Vatican II. Just burn a little bit of incense. Bishop Fillet, no problem. Just accept Vatican II in the light of tradition, which he did 10 years ago. And this is the 10th year of that huge compromise. And once you compromise on doctrine, it's only a matter of time before you compromise on, on morals. Once you accept the new Mass is legitimately promulgated, which means it's good. We don't like it, but it's good. Good for the souls. Once you admit that, which he did and signed on in 2012 and never recanted ever since, and said that all the new sacraments are all valid and all legitimately promulgated, that's, that's a huge compromise against the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre fought that one word, legitimate. The new Mass is not legitimately promulgated. The new sacraments are not legitimately promulgated. They are poisonous to souls. And that's why Pope Francis has made it very clear, we will not allow traditional sacraments. No more traditional baptism with the five exorcisms and the blessed salt and the, the anointings with the chrism. None of that. No more uh, traditional extreme unctions for the dying. No more traditional confession. We call it the, the, the talk and get together inside the confessional face to face. No more of the traditional accusing myself of being a poor sinner and, and, and routing out my sins and asking God mercy. No more, no more of the traditional uh, marriage. And now, of course, you know that all the new SSPX, as part of their deals with Rome, all their marriages have to be approved by the local diocesan bishop. And you might say, well, what's, the, what's wrong with that? That's a good thing, they say. It's a good thing. But Archbishop Lefebvre, more, far more wise than any of the four bishops he consecrated, he warned, do not put yourself under these modernist bishops. They are out to destroy the faith. And even if they allow the Latin mass here and the Latin mass there, it's all with liberalism and modernism soaked in it. 
So yeah, Father so-and-so, you can say the Latin Mass, but you also have to say the new Mass at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday and throughout the week. So for one Sunday, you got a schizophrenic priest now, half Navasoto, half, half uh, traditional. And then traditional priests who are exclusively Latin Mass, the danger is the liberal ideas. And I'll come back to that. But here is a great pope battling for the faith, a good and holy pope right in the heat of the persecutions. St. Marcellus did not listen to the violent words of man. And he was sent by the emperor to a, a stable to, make, to take, take care of the beasts, which were kept in the public, at the public expense. So he was there to take care of the horses, donkeys, probably the lions and tigers as well, because they were used for the gladiatorial games. In this place, St. Marcellus spent nine months of his life fasting and praying without ceasing, and visiting by his letters the churches he could not visit in person. So he would write letters to all the churches. So here's a pope in prison. From there he was delivered by some of his clergy. So they rescued him after nine months. And he was sheltered by the blessed Lucina, in whose house he dedicated a church, which is to this day called the Church of St. Marcellus. Here the Christians assembled for prayer, and the blessed Marcellus preached to them. When, when Maxentius heard these things, he ordered the wild beasts to be brought from the stables into the very house and church of Lucina, and St. Marcellus was made to be their keeper. And another, uh, another fact that rose up during his pontificate was during the persecutions, you would have Catholics who would burn incense. They would sign the libellus, the document that said they burnt incense to the gods, but they really didn't. So they were considered apostates. And the early Catholics were wondering, well, what do we do with them? They want to come back to Mass. They want to come back to confession, but they apostatized from the faith. What do we do with them? And so Pope St. Marcellus said, they can come back but they must go to confession and they must do penance and public penance for the scandal. So that was a big fight in the early church also with those, those who lapsed and those who persevered and went to martyrdom. So he settled the question. They had to do bigger penance. And remember, some of them did die after apostatizing. And you don't save your soul when we apostatize. That is, deny the, reject the Catholic faith. So, so what happened to St. Marcellus? He became very sick by the foul atmosphere of working with the animals in the barn. And worn out by many hardships, he fell asleep in the Lord. He died on January 16th, today, in the year 310. The Blessed Lucina had his body buried in the cemetery of St. Priscilla on the Salarian Way in Rome, the 17th of the calends of February, January 16th. He reigned five, five years, one month, and 25 days. He wrote a letter to the bishops of the province of Antioch concerning the primacy of the Roman Church, which he proves ought to be called the head of the churches. This is also a great Catholic point. Rome... The, the primacy of the Roman pontiff, the primacy of the Pope. In the same letter, there occurs this passage, that no council may be lawfully held without the authority of the Roman pontiff. He ordained at Rome in the month of December 25 priests, two deacons, and 21 bishops for various places. So St. Marcel He's well. Uh, he is, he's, he's a good patron for our founder, the great Archbishop Lefebvre. He's a good name for him because Archbishop Lefebvre, he wasn't Pope. Too bad he wasn't. He would have been a good Pope. But he was a good bishop, and he resisted the Pope. He stood opposed to three popes in his lifetime. Pope Paul VI, who crushed him with a, sus uh, a suspension, a false suspension, and then Pope John Paul II, the ecumenical pope, 
who crushed him with a false excommunication. And the Archbishop Lefebvre considered their excommunication as a badge of honor because he said, this separates us from the conciliar church. This separates us from that bastard mass. This separates us from those bastard sacraments. This separates us from the Church of Assisi and the Pentecostal Charismatic Church of Vatican II. And he was proud of it. And that's why it was a great disgrace for the four bishops later to write a letter to Pope Benedict and say, oh, please lift our excommunications. That was an insult to our Lord. That was an insult to our founder. And it was absolute cowardice. <laughs> because how can something be lifted that wasn't even a valid thing? The excommunication wasn't even valid. It wasn't lawful. Just like the excommunication of St. Athanasius under Pope Liberius, who favored the Arian heretics, that excommunication didn't hold. It was null and void. So they asked it to be lifted, and Bishop Fillet, of course, celebrated this to the shame of, of those four bishops. So pray for them. Pray for them. So let me uh, remind you of some sound words of Archbishop Lefebvre. He's talking here about Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI. When, Pope Be when Cardinal Ratzinger was saying, the, we have to adopt all the two centuries of Masonic principles, of liberal culture. So the church has to accept all religions are more or less the same. The church has to accept the uncrowning of Christ the King. No more Catholic states, no more Catholic constitutions. We need the atheistic state, the, the state that's neutral on matters of religion. And that's the height of Masonic victory. So Archbishop Lefebvre said this is wrong. And this is what he said. It is clear religious liberty ecumenism, and the rights of man. It's the rights of man, the declaration of the rights of man, which I remind you was written by the Freemasons, condemned by Pope Pius VI at the French Revolution. And it basically is what's behind the girl going today to get her abortion. She says, it's my right, it's my body, my choice. That's what she says. And that's a, that's the liberal principle. I, I have my rights to do what I want with my body. And there's some truth to that, especially when we're faced with these force mandates. There's some truth to it. But when it goes against God's law, that's when it's wrong. So we don't have the right to abort our babies. We don't have the right to live like sodomites. We don't have the right to eugenically test on, the, on, the, on fetuses of children. We don't have that right. So this is what the, what's behind the Declaration of the Rights of Man. So Archbishop Lefebvre continues. He says, it's satanic. And the Cardinal Ratzinger says, that's one accomplishment. Now we have to find a new balance. He doesn't say that we should get rid of the principles and values which come from the liberal culture, but that we have to find a new balance this so-called new balance is the balance which Opus Dei have. A traditional-looking exterior, an exterior of piety, an exterior of religious discipline, but with liberal ideas. This is so, so, so solid, so important to, to get understand this. Yes, you can have your Latin Mass, but if you've got a priest who believes in Vatican II, don't go to it. He's a liberal, and you, ex you share his faith if he accepts and believes Vatican II or compromises in any way with Vatican II or the new Mass. If you or I attend that Mass, that means you accept that faith of modernism. And that's why the early Catholics during the French Revolution would not go to the Latin Mass of priests who signed the oath, who accepted the Masonic ideas. They all had the Latin Mass. But as Archbishop Lefebvre said, our fight is not firstly about the Mass. For Bishop Fillet and Father Pigliardiani, now that's what they say. The fight is all about the Mass, the Mass, the Mass. So you can go to St. Peter's, you can go to the Indult Mass, you can go to these other compromise Masses, no problem. But for Archbishop Lefebvre, it wasn't firstly about the Mass. He said it firstly about the faith. And this is what he's talking about. The liberal ideas, we must oppose them and fight them and never accept them. 
And they are religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, freedom of conscience, and the, the many other errors that flow from it. So he's talking here, this new balance of combining the traditional Latin Mass with Vatican II, with the liberal ideas. This so-called new balance is the balance which Opus Dei have, a traditional-looking exterior, an exterior of piety, an exterior of religious discipline, but with liberal ideas. There's no, there's no concept of fighting against the rights of man, against, of fighting against religious liberty, and fighting against ecumenism. So for this new balance, they'll have to put down liberation theology a little bit. You talk a little bit against liberation theology, Marxist theology. And they'll have to talk a little bit against the French bishops, a little due to their, and, and due to their catechism. It'll mean they'll have to give a little bit of satisfaction to those who have a real nostalgia for the old mass. And voila, and there, there you have it. Ultimately, they'll give the impression of wanting to return to tradition, but they don't really want to do so. So we have to warn our faithful. This is Archbishop Lefebvre talking to his priests in 1984. We have to warn our faithful in such a way that they don't end up being fooled, so that they don't let themselves be taken in by an exterior traditional reform, which would fatally lead them into adopting liberalism and liberal ideas. So for the Archbishop, close quote, that's St. Nicolas de Chardonnay, he gave that talk, on December 13th, 1984. And it still applies. It still applies. We were not just about the Latin Mass Catholics. There's never been such a thing in the history of the Church, just Latin Mass Catholics. The, 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 tr the true Catholics, as Archbishop Lefebvre is saying, are those who hold the Catholic faith integrally. That means you've got to fight against the liberal ideas. You cannot accept separation of church and state. We cannot accept a neutral government. We want the kingship of Christ. We want a Catholic government. We want the sacred heart of Jesus on our flag in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it's going to happen. Your rosaries are never put to waste. Your sacrifices are not being wasted. Our Lady is gathering up all these things for her great victory to overthrow the Masonic powers over the whole world. They got the whole world in the grip of the Great Reset now. And Our Lady of Quito, her statue's on the epistle side, on the far end. Our Lady of Quito said, right when the Freemasons think they have everything under their control and their Great Reset is finally established, she says, then I will step in and overthrow it. And God will give us finally a good Pope who will consecrate Russia as Our Lady of Fatima asked. And when Russia is consecrated by the Pope and bishops of the world, heaven will open the floodgates of grace. And the prophecies say, out of France will rise a great monarch. There will be a good and holy angelic Pope. And, and the kingship of Christ will be established all over the world. So the United States will be a Catholic government. And that's what we're fighting for. We don't want just some liberal Republican or Democrat who's as liberal as and are, are conservative. Those words are phony. They're phony words because they work for the same team. Father Buffet was in, he grew up in South Africa, excuse me, in, in Zimbabwe, which was, uh, used to be, it's now called Rhodesia. Uh, used to be Rhodesia, it's now called Zimbabwe. And he and some of his friends, they were fighting in the army. And they thought they were fighting against the communists, trying to destroy their country. But they found out later, through some miscommunications, that the very enemies they were fighting were all under the same head. So they, were, they were just playing a huge chess game and making the, the good army, the, the defenders of their country, seem like they're defending their country while the communists invading and they were waging the wars, but it was the same ones on top who were working it all out like a huge game. And when they realized that, that's when Father Buffet and, and uh, some of his friends entered the society seminary back in 80, 84 or 5. 
and Father Buffet is a priest in Ireland now. So, so uh, that's the same. With the, Masa the Masons don't mind conservatives and liberals. They don't mind Republicans and Domin Democrats. They don't mind all this because they're playing the whole game. And it's Satan at the head. That's why we don't want any part of this, this fake system. We Catholics want to establish the real, the real social order of Christ the King. And that will bring in the large families, the, the marriage protected, no more divorce laws, no more abortion laws, no more sodomite laws, no more destroying our children by rotten education. The education would be a hand, usually in the hands of the church, the nuns, the monks, the priests. And tra being traditional and, and disciplined, they will form them well. So these, this is all part of what Archbishop of Fev and St. Pius X and Father Dennis Fahey call the, the reign of Christ the King, the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we're fighting for. And for our church, that's in God's hands. So we've got to persevere. And in the meantime, resist Pope Francis. Resist him to the face. We don't obey his orders to do ab abolish the true Mass and accept these new sacraments in Vatican II. We, we don't accept this. And if you are I do, we turn our back on our Lord and we'll probably go to hell. We cannot compromise the faith. So persevere in this battle. It's a glorious time to be Catholic. It's a beautiful time to be Catholic. The saints looked at these days and were envious of, of you and I to be able to preserve the faith on the most basic issues in a day, in a day that's sliding into hell and into the lies. And people are drinking the lies like crazy. I cannot believe even Catholics are drinking the, the lies. And the most obvious lies is using the children as medicine, dead, massacred children as medicine. And they're, they're accepting this. And they just say, well, I blame the priest, the priest, the society priests approve it. So what's wrong with that? Well, I say this, and it'd be on, it'd be on my head as well if I, if I approved it, these uh, so-called shots. Those priests will be responsible for the many deaths that will happen by their advice. They'll be responsible for the many deaths, plus, the, plus indirectly the deaths of those babies that were killed to pr produce this, this terrible so-called medicine. So let's turn to the Mother of God. Let's pray to St. Marcel. Let's pray to the, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary to come in quick and crush the head of Satan, restore the church, restore the political order to the reign of Christ the King. And let's pray for this. Our Lady promised it. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. She said at Fatima. She said it at Quito. I will step in and overthrow and establish the reign of my son. So these days are going to come. And it's very possible you young ones might live to see these days. Things are moving fast, so they might come sooner than we expect. But persevere. Our Lady asked the daily rosary, the wearing of the scapular, Unite everything you do with the Immaculate Heart of Mary in reparation. When you're freezing cold, when you uh, are sick, when you've got crosses to carry, when you have contradictions, when you have some poverty, when you have situations which are very difficult, these are blessings from heaven. And unite it with the Immaculate Heart of Mary for the salvation of souls, to help save souls from hell. And this is the true charity. We must look for the salvation of our neighbor. So we got to pray for these rotten psychopaths over us, politically and in the church. we got to pray for them, for their conversion, so they don't go to hell and, and die and go to hell. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.